question for you. What's well, got four wheels? It's usually bright red, pretty rare, pretty expensive, steeped in motorsport heritage, and enjoys an almost religious following from devout fans the world over. If you're thinking Ferrari, you're wrong, because today those adjectives apply to an Audi, specifically this Audi, the S1 Sport Quattro. right out here in these surroundings. It's funny, isn't it? When you completely transform your environment, it changes the cars that you lust after. Back home in the UK, I'm constantly dribbling over Ferraris, Porsches, and such like. But here, I can hardly think of anything I'd rather have than that. Produced between 1983 and 1984, the S1 Sport Quattro was one of the most coveted and expensive Audis of all time. It was their best effort to turn the struggling A1 Quattro rally car into a more competitive Group B contender and resulted in this extraordinary homologation special. Based on the 1980 Audi Quattro itself, an evolution of the humble Audi 80. It's got a 2.1 litre inline five cylinder 20 valve turbocharged engine outputting 302 brake horsepower and 243 foot pounds of torque. But the long wheelbase car soon started to struggle when rival manufacturers like Peugeot and Lancia introduced purpose built thoroughbred bespoke competition cars that severely tested the spirit of the Group B regulations. Audi sports engineers wanted to start over, design a completely new rally car from scratch, but the marketing executives objected, concerned that their flagship Quattro might be considered a failure. Instead, they demanded that the car be fixed. Audi put the car on a massive diet. Where possible, substituting steel panels for lightweight materials such as aluminium, fiberglass, and even carbon Kevlar composites. They also locked a whopping 320 millimeters from the length of the car. That's about 12 and a half inches taken from just behind the doors, and it resulted in this wonderful, slightly awkward, boxy shape that makes the car look a little squished, concertina ready to leap back out at a drop of the clutch. Under the hood, they kept the same inline five-cylinder engine, but this time cast the whole thing in lightweight aluminium. Audi finally had the basis of a car which might, just might, get them back into the hunt of the Group B World Rally Championship. But it was such a departure from its incumbent that a whole new homologation was required. And thus was born this, the road-going S1 Sport Quattro. So what's it like to drive? Well, starting out with the driving position, it's surprisingly upright. This fabulous OMP suede-clad steering wheel sort of plonks down in your lap giving me the chance to sort of fling the car into the corners and adopt more of a shuffling technique on the steering wheel than the more traditional racer's crossed arms approach. I don't know if the competition cars had such high rising seats, but certainly in this, I'm grateful for the extra headroom afforded by the pretty vertical windscreen. But behind that, angle of windscreen lies an interesting anecdote because the drivers of the previous longer wheelbase quattro rally car complained of a lot of glare and reflection and i love the very rudimentary solution that audi's engineers applied when building 
this new homologation car to that problem. It simply fitted the old Audi 80 front end, which had a more upright screen than the Quattro. Problem solved. What about the chassis? Well, it's steel monocoque construction in all the car weighs 1,270 kilograms, which is not too bad for what is fundamentally a family saloon. It's disc brakes all around and independent suspension, which is beautifully damped, particularly on these undulations here in the Alps. I really love the way the car has compliance. It doesn't lurch, it doesn't feel like it rolls excessively, and it doesn't take its set and then bounce back up like so many other cars, creating a lack of predictability. Instead, it's like a sponge. It squashes into the corner, the rear end working in harmony with the front. In these fast left-right direction changes, even on slippery ground, there's an astonishing amount of mechanical grip. And when I prod the steering excessively into some of the tighter turns, expecting to trigger some understeer through the apex, there's nothing. The whole thing just flexes, twists and sinks down into the ground and sticks. Now we're rattling along fourth gear, down to third, revs up high about 5,000, the turbo is fully spooled, everything's ready, I'm not really having to use too much steering lock, I can lean on the tyre, it's ever so predictable, nothing sudden, no snapping, and this car was criticised by the media in period for having terminal understeer, particularly at low speeds, and then being very tricky and twitchy at high speeds, but I can't say I'm feeling any of that. It's absolutely magic. <laughs> oh, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Now, by creating this car, Audi were trying to address two fundamental problems of the older, longer Quattro. The first was that it was too heavy, and the second was that it suffered terminal understeer, primarily because of that very heavy engine mounted in the front, over the front axle. By lopping 32 centimeters out of this section of the car, they obviously made an instant weight saving. But what it also did is that it shortened the wheelbase, and that makes the rear of the car less stable. It doesn't directly address the understeer problem because they still had the engine up the front. But what it does do is make the car more agile in the quick direction changes. Now this did help partly to overcome the understeer, but it made the car quite tricky to drive and the professional drivers needed to adapt their style trail braking into the corner to get the front end loaded, destabilize the rear. And that's why the likes of Stig Blumfist and Walter Roll became so known for that left foot braking technique. The problem, however, was that when these 220 or so road cars were offered to the public and tested by automotive journalists, they weren't quite able to drive the car as it needed to be driven to overcome that understeer, and it was criticized for it. But I find that so frustrating because that misses the point. The whole essence of a homologation special is that it's created to allow manufacturers to win competitions. It's not created to appease the public or appease the automotive media. And if ultimately the owners can't drive it in the way that the engineers intended, tough, what matters? is does it deliver on the rally stages? Funnily enough, Audi did actually win the championship title in 1984, courtesy of Stig Blomqvist, but only after the star driver reverted back to the older, longer wheelbase version, which better suited his style. Despite this success, in 1985, Audi decided to focus exclusively on the shorter S1 version, and in doing so, gave the world the outrageous E2 iteration. 
littered with wings, appendages and splitters that gave up to half a tonne of downforce and blessed with 600 or so brake horsepower. It was, as Walter Roll describes in perhaps the understatement of the century, an intense machine. And yet still, it wasn't enough. A solitary win at the San Remo rally in 1985 was a rare highlight. But by the end of 86, the car was effectively done, except for that famous one-off outing in the 1987 Pikes Peak. All told, the Quattro won 23 stages, four championship titles, two for drivers and two for manufacturers. So it was a great rally car, but it fundamentally suffered against cars that had been built from day one to be rally champions. And this, of course, was the most powerful, by far, in fact, of all the Group B era homologation specials that found their way onto the roads. Most of the others had about 200 or so horsepower, which pales into insignificance compared to the 302 brake from this. Although this car did allow Audi to re-engage in the arms race that was Group B rallying in the mid-1980s, it's fair to say it didn't deliver the dominance that they might have hoped. It is cherished today, however, because not only did we get this wonderful homologation special, but it also formed the basis of all of the iterations that Audi created to stay competitive on the world rallying scene. And that iterative program culminated in what I think was a paradigmatic car for the brand, the crazy E2 that Walter Roll bullied in a sort of mechanical ballet throughout the 1985 season. It's a car that for many, definitely for me, is the defining icon of rallying's golden era. <laughs>